So we've just finished walking through the pathway that blood takes through the heart, and that's due to the pumping of the four chambers of the heart. What is it that causes those chambers to pump? Um, to understand the answer to that, we need to think back to the electrical activity that cells have. So electrical activity of the heart. To get us into this, a few reminders. So number one, cardiac muscle cells are connected by intercalated discs. Those are gap junctions that provide a direct connection between cells. So if there's ion flow going on in one cell, um, that ion flow is able to transmit directly into the adjacent cell due to these special types of connections in cardiac muscle cells. Another reminder, um, the heart, we've talked about the atria and the ventricles, the upper chambers, the atria, those t tend to act sort of as one distinct muscular unit. They respond to electrical signals um, sort of as one unit, and then the ventricles respond separately as a separate unit. So we refer to those two different sections as myocardia and sort of like functional units of the heart in terms of the muscular activity. Um, we'll see the electrical differences in just a minute between those two sections. What it is that provides a separation between those are, is the fibrous skeleton of the heart. So um, there's a uh, separation that provides an electrical separation between the upper and lower chambers of the heart. In the last chapter, we mentioned the pacemaker cells of the heart and just the fact that some cells can provide sort of a pacemaker function. Um, so this provides automaticity of the heart. Uh, this is just referring to the fact that the heart can beat automatically. So it does have nerve uh, innervations from the autonomic nervous system, but what that nervous system is doing is more just helping to control the rate. Um, so even without the nerve stimulation, the heart would still continue to beat. So let's look at those pacemaker cells of the heart. On the heart, um, on the top of the right atrium, there is a collection of cells, right? Right, let me get my laser pointer. Right here, this is called the SA node, node the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node is the natural pacemaker section of the heart. Um, the cells that are located here undergo a spontaneous depolarization and that electrical signal ends up getting spread out as a wave throughout the rest of the heart. So we're gonna go through this in some detail, talking about the pacemaker cells right here in the SA node, the sinoatrial node. Okay, so the cells that are located there um, have an interesting action potential pattern that they undergo. And the thing that is really unique about the cells um, in the SA node is that they respond to hyperpolarization. So if we just walk through this action potential, so think back to a, like a normal, quote unquote, normal action potential that we learned about with nerves, with neurons. Um, at the end of an action potential, the membrane has to get repolarized, right? And that's just the ion pumps do their thing. They sort of reestablish the, the resting potential. So th think in terms of that. Okay, so here we're repolarizing, getting ready for another action potential. Okay, we end up going into, right, this is millivolts. We go into the negatives. We get down um, to quite polarized. This is hyperpolarization. And hyperpolarization causes certain ion channels to open. So what's different about this? Always in the past, we've referred to depolarization, initiating an, an ion channel to open. In this case though, it's hyperpolarization. So these are voltage-gated ion channels that respond to hyperpolarization. They're called HCN. Um, these HCN channels open, and that allows sodium to leak across the membrane. So what's that gonna do? If sodium can leak across the membrane, this is actually going to depolarize the membrane just a little bit. And that's what we refer to as the pacemaker potential. This is the sort of the spontaneous depolarization that's going to lead to another action potential taking place. So once that depolarization reaches about minus 40 millivolts, um, that depolarization will cause calcium channels to open voltage-gated calcium channels. So those channels open, and then calcium is gonna rush into the cytoplasm, 
what does that do? Think, think in terms of muscle, right? We're sitting here in the heart. This is a muscular tissue. Um, so if calcium floods into the cytoplasm, what's it going to do? It's going to uh, cause a contraction to take place. Okay, so the heart will beat. Uh, the cells locally, they will beat in response to this action potential. The action potential is going to end, similar to what we've learned about in previous chapters, um, calcium channels, voltage-gated calcium, uh, voltage-gated potassium channels will open, okay, potassium channels open, and that leads to repolarization of the cell membrane. So once this action potential occurs, remember we were talking about cells right here in the SA node. Once an action potential occurs right here, um, that's going to spread to the rest of the cells in this myocardium. And particularly, the signal transmits from the SA node um, to down in this region, the AV node. And that results in contraction of this whole upper chamber, the, the atria of the heart, the upper chambers will contract and then um, the electrical signal gets transmitted down to the lower chambers of the heart. So right here, um, this AV node, it comes down into the, the barrier between the left and right ventricles. This is called the septum of the heart. Um, this is referred to as the bundle of Hiss. The bundle of Hiss splits into two different, two different pathways and um, ends up branching into Purkinje fibers. Anyway, um, down in the lower chambers of the heart, and once the electrical signal spreads down here, then the lower chambers are going to be together, the ventricles. Remember, that's a separate myocardium from the atria. So all of this electrical activity that's going on inside of the heart, this leads to changes in voltage or potentials in the surrounding tissues. Um, this is true just generally anytime you have charged particles moving, they are going to create a potential difference in the region around them. And so this turns out to be very useful medically in the sense that we can take measurements just on the surface of the body. We can take readings, voltage readings on the surface of the body that allow us to understand what is going on internally inside of the heart. This is what an ECG or an EKG is. An electrocardiogram um, is a technique by which we can measure the electrical activity around the heart. So what's done in this procedure, um, by the way, the machine, the machine that is used to take this sort of reading is called an electrocardiograph. And then the reading that it takes is an electrocardiogram. So this so gets abbreviated a couple of different ways, either ECG or EKG. Anyway, to perform um, an electrocardiogram, electrical leads are placed on the surface of the body, around the heart, on the chest, and also in a couple of other places, like on the arms and legs, just to give sort of reference values. And the reading that we get from an electrocardiogram um, looks something like this. So. Okay, as the depolarization wave spreads throughout the atria, um, we're, we're walking down through this figure, okay, so depolarization is shown in yellow. Okay, so first the right atrium depolarizes, that depolar depolarization spreads to the left atria as well. And as those chambers undergo depolarization, this leads to the first little peak on the graph. That's called a P wave. Um, as the signal spreads down to the ventricles, okay, so upper chambers, let's continue on up here, upper chambers then start to repolarize, repolarize, re ah, it's been a long day, repolarize, okay, and the signal um, gets sent to the lower chambers of the heart, so they start to depolarize. As the ventricles depolarize, that ends up leading to this second major peak in the graph. Um, this is called the QRS section of the graph. And then finally, repolarization of the ventricles leads to the last little blip right there. And this whole thing is what we are used to seeing as the very characteristic heartbeat signal. Um, so a couple of things to note. This graph, this is not actually showing us action potentials. Rather, it's showing us sort of the, um, well, it's the change in voltage around the heart due to the action potentials. So it's kind of like the net result of all of the action potentials that are taking place. Um, so it's the result of these waves of depolarization that happen. And then the other thing 
to note is that this doesn't show us a direct picture of muscle contractions. It's not measuring muscle contractions. Rather, again, it's just measuring the depolarization in the vicinity around the heart. So interestingly, uh, we can understand a lot of information about what's going on in the heart just due to this picture, this snapshot graph. Um, but it's important to keep in note, keep in mind um, what it is and what it is not. So let's look at one of these pictures uh, a little bit closer up. So the, the electrocardiogram okay, has these three distinctive peaks and um, those are corresponding to depolarization in different regions of the heart. So the P wave, this first little bit right here, this again is corresponding to atrial depolarization. After that depolarization is when the atria would actually undergo a contraction, contract, um, followed by the QRS wave. The QRS is corresponding to the, ven the ventricles depolarizing. So right after that depolarization takes place, the ventricles will contract, systole will take place. So ventricle contraction occurs. And then finally the T wave, this is corresponding to repolarization of all of the cells in the ventricles. So depolarization always is gonna be followed by contraction. But again, don't, don't get it confused. The peaks on this graph, this is not representing actual contraction, right? Contraction is a little bit delayed. It's after depolarization takes place. So this is what a normal electrocardiogram looks like. Um, of course, if, if the heart is not functioning properly, if there are problems with either electrical conduction or just the actual um, physical structures within the heart, sometimes that can lead to different sorts of readings on an electrocardiogram. And so specialists get very good at interpreting the different signals, different spacings between the peaks, different problems that can go on. Um, arrhythmias can be detected very clearly by using electrocardiograms. Arrhythmias are abnormal patterns of elect electrical activity in the heart. And there are different types of arrhythmias. Some of them are tied to what's going on with um, the atria, depolarization in the atria. Some of them are tied to what's going on in the ventricles. In either case, they can be very serious. They can be very dangerous. Um, if the electrical activity in the heart is not correct, if it's not following the, the standard pattern, um, then that's going to lead to problems with blood flow. So drugs to treat arrhythmias, um, there are different categories of these drugs. I think there are four major groupings of antiarrhythmal drugs, um, but what they do is they work on different sorts of ion channels that are present and very important for these depolarization waves to happen. So different arrhythmia drugs are categorized ac according to which um, ion channel or which receptor they bind to.